I'd like to share with you uh, some of my thoughts and experiences on water. And they say uh, that every talk should start at the beginning. So I guess I need to start at the beginning with water. So here goes. In the beginning, before there was even light, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters of the earth. The oldest fossils we find on the planet are stromatolites, three billion year old fossils, composed and formed by blue green algae in the primeval sea. The waters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers nourished the cradle of civilization. John baptized Jesus in water. The Quran tells us that Allah made all living things from water. I can go for weeks without eating, but after about three days without water, I begin to die. So it's no, it's no wonder that something of such critical importance, when it's in limited supply and has to be shared, can become a point of contention. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. And I've gone the wrong way. Uh, in 2006, uh, I had the opportunity to visit Cambodia and traveled up the Mekong River and across the Tonle Sap, Southeast Asia's largest lake. And I saw how people in Cambodia depended upon water for everything. 50% of Cambodia's protein resources come from the waters of the Tonle Sap. And I heard about how concerned people were with what was happening upstream in Laos and in China, where the Mekong and its tributaries were being dammed for power and for agriculture. And I heard how concerned people were in Cambodia about their future and about their fate. Cambodia is a downstream user and not very well armed. In the Middle East, most of the nations are currently using greater than 100% of their renewable water resources. That's not a good thing. In Egypt, home to 80 million people, the Nile is the pillar of life. People depend upon this for everything. Unfortunately for Egypt, the Nile runs through Sudan and finds its origins up in the highlands of Ethiopia. So Egypt, like Cambodia, is a downstream user. Unlike Cambodia, though, Egypt is pretty well armed. In 1959, Egypt entered into an agreement, the Nile's Water Agreement, with Sudan, and giving uh, Egypt 75% of the total flow of the Nile and Sudan the other 25%. This despite the fact that 75% of the Nile's flow starts up in the highlands of Ethiopia. Egypt has said the only thing it will go to war over in the future is water. So for now, the people in Ethiopia go hungry and go thirsty and tread lightly. In 2009, I had the opportunity to travel to Saudi Arabia as a consultant on a water engineering project. The Saudis have burned through about 50% of their aquifers, and despite the fact that in 2005 they installed low-flow toilets in all the palaces, if they continue on this course, they may be down to the bottom of their aquifers by 2025. So what the Sau Saudis have done is turned to desalination to make up this water that they've been depleting. Desalination is really a miraculous technology for the Saudis in their desert kingdom. Uh, in one side of this plant, they'll feed seawater, and the other side, oil, this is an incredibly in energy-intensive process. Uh, and what is the product? The product of this manufacturing process is potable water. The Saudis currently supply 70% of the potable water demand in their country with desalinated water. Only a small fraction goes to agriculture. The Saudis are the lucky ones in this region in that they have this technology and they still have oil but there are others in the Middle East and in North Africa who are not so lucky. Every year since 2005, I've taken students from Penn State overseas to Morocco to study water resources with their classmates at the Ecole Mohammedia in the capital city of Rabat. Although Morocco is an arid country, they only rely on about 40% of their renewable water resources, so they're in pretty good shape, but the future looks quite a bit drier for Morocco and for the countries in this region because of climate change. Remarkably, before I can talk to my students from the United States about the effects of climate change on countries like Morocco, 
I have to talk about the reality of climate change and the politics, the perceived politics of climate change. Um, because it appears that climate change is a political issue in this country. And it appears that way because of a few very vocal, very unremarkable fringe politicians. But I'm here to tell you today that climate change is probably outside of the scientific community. Within the scientific community, there's a consensus. Outside of the scientific community, we find that there's agreement on this issue of climate change from people at different ends of the political spectrum and from seemingly disparate places. If you don't believe me, I'll prove it to you. Climate change is the one thing that George Bush and Al Gore agree on. In 2007, President Bush told us that climate change is the greatest challenge facing the United States in the 21st century, and we, as Americans, need to lead the world in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions that are driving global warming. The EPA and industry often at odds. CEOs of our major corporations from across the manufacturing spectrum have said that we need to begin cutting down on our greenhouse gas emissions, stabilizing global temperatures, and in fact, by doing so, across our manufacturing sector, we'll actually create more economic opportunities than we create risks. And finally, even hippies in the military agree about climate change. Our military leadership tells us that climate change represents a national security threat to our country. So, it's remarkable that 50% of the American people either don't believe that the planet is heating up or think it's heating up, but it's just some, some phase we're going through. Um, remarkable. Uh, and it's because of a few loud, fringe, and unremarkable politicians. But we really need to change the conversation from uh, if climate change is occurring to what does it mean for our planet. And to get a, a few glimpses at what the future might look like, we can turn to the folks that office with the CIA in Langley, Virginia, the National Intelligence Council. And the NIC tells us that we can expect to see an exacerbation of resource scarcity. So, in areas of the world where there is just barely enough food and barely enough water now, uh, because of climate change, we'll find that these, in these areas there won't be enough food and there won't be enough water. In addition, climate change will act as a, uh, to promote conflict, as a threat multiplier. So where there are threats, these threats will be accentuated. Where there aren't threats, threats will arise. The conflicts will be over the disappearing resources, the water and the food. Mexico City is home to 20 million people in the Mexico, in the greater metropolitan area. Right now, at best, they have sporadic access to water. In Mexico City, the water may be on for 24 hours and then off for about 72. NIC tells us that Mexico is going to be particularly hard hit by climate change, especially in the central and northern regions. And unfortunately for Mexico, they have a very weak adaptive capacity. Um, but it's a good thing we've been building a wall and a fence down there on the border with Mexico to prevent that northern Mexican climate change from entering Texas. You know, clearly, uh, climate change will affect Texas uh, the same way it'll affect northern Mexico. And we see that by 2050, evapotranspiration may exceed precipitation in the state of Texas. That means when it rains or when it snows, all of that water will effectively disappear into thin air. The Texas Water Development Board has just issued a report where they've been tracking temperatures in the state of Texas over the last 10 years. Temperatures have been steadily increasing. The Texas Water Development Board predicts that by the end of the 21st century, temperatures in Texas may be as much as 10 degrees higher than they are now. This will profoundly affect the way Texans lead their lives. And perversely, Texas leads the nation in greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, if Texas were looked at as a nation, it would be the seventh largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world.
the same greenhouse gases that will result in this destruction of their state. So the, the final question is then, what can we do about this? Um, you know, here in, uh, here in central Pennsylvania, if I put in a low flow toilet in my house, the water that I save is not going to be transferred, cannot be conveyed to folks in Ethiopia or Egypt or Morocco or even Texas. So what is it that we can do here in the United States in terms of water resources on a global scale? And the answer is we can begin to uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and to confront this climate change challenge. Probably the first thing we can do on a macro scale is stop subsidizing the combustion of fossil fuels. Do you know that in 2010, on a global scale, we paid almost half a trillion dollars to promote the combustion of fossil fuels. By simply stopping this promotion, we could cut down on global energy demand by about 5%. That's effectively eliminating the energy demand of New Zealand, Japan, and Korea combined just by getting rid of these fossil subsidies. We need to stop propping these old fuels up. Um, and then also, we really need to become introspective. And we need to ask ourselves how we can begin leading a more sustainable life. And maybe a place to start is in our homes. Our residential homes are responsible for 20% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So we can start by tightening up our homes, by looking at how we use electricity in our lives, by turning the thermostat down this winter and putting a sweater on. And, and even the food choices we make, we can minimize our greenhouse gas emissions. You know, red meat and dairy are very greenhouse gas uh, intensive food groups. And even buying locally. You know that it, at the, our average food travels 1,500 miles here in the United States before it reaches our plates. 1,500 miles. Look, in the end, it, it boils down to really two choices. Right? Either we strategically and electively change how we live and maybe enrich our lives at the same time, or the changing world will change things for us. And history has shown us that civilizations on the rise meet challenges just like the one we're being faced with. They meet them squarely with creativity, with innovation, and with bold, brave action. Civilizations in decline meet these types of challenges with fear and denial. So, I'm gonna leave you with this. If someone comes knocking on your door, telling you that climate change is a hoax, or telling you that there's nothing we can do about climate change, it's impossible to do anything about climate change, and it won't be that bad. Um, really, all we need to do here in the first world is maybe build more air conditioners. And, and those people in the third world, well, they just need to move somewhere else. You just tell those scaredy cats to shut the front door. <laughs> because this is America, and here, nothing is impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Rick.